southward bound, deepest red chrysanthemums. Earth's first rains, smoky breeze. Fresh picked apples, honey sweet. Golden morning and the world reborn. Here we gather to greet the year. Invitation to improve our lives. Joyful season and judgment day. Know this truth, we are free to change. Let the shofar summon us home. Make this moment our return to you. Now in celebration, join. Open us to the gifts of life. Shana Tova. It's so nice to see you this afternoon, to usher in this brand new year. When I woke up this morning and the sun was out, I thought, thank you, God, for this blessing of light. Thank you for showing us, reminding us of this great good earth. Now, just to be clear, theologically, I don't think God controls the weather. I'm just going to make that clear. God is our God is our partner. God is our inspiration. But we have to do the work. We have to do all the work. But that's our job. That's why we were created. Because God needed partners, and here we are. I wanted to tell you this morning, at 8.30, we had our family service, the one that used to be at 2 and now it's at 8.30, in case you were still expecting to, and so I let you know. So um, we handed out, and I apologize to the young parents, I, we passed out chauffeurote to the kids, and it's such a beautiful sound. So, you know, it's not a classic tequila, but, you know, it'll do. Anyway, I, 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 we bought them with like a, a big box. And I didn't really look at them until really after the kids' service. And I looked, and there's a decal on both sides. I thought, oh, that's really cool. It probably says, May you be written and sealed in the Book of Life. So I looked at it and it says, Lishana Tova Tikatevu Viticha Temu, which means, uh, may, you, uh, may you be written in the Book of Life and excommunicated. <laughs> yeah, so, Tichad Remu, you know, then I thought, so either. It's a Chinese plot, which, you know, is very current these days. Or, or it's uh, an ultra-Orthodox plot. Uh, I don't know what the message is, um, but if they have them, that's too late now, you know. So. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you will uh, go with the good news of the, uh, of the show far, and we'll worry about the, you know, We'll worry about excommunication later. You know, 
Folks come into the sanctuary this morning, and some of you are, you know, you're hardcore daveners. You love the holidays and the prayers and the music, and it feels like a, uh, like you're recharging some deep spiritual energy. And for some of you, you come and you're here because of obligation to your family, to your friends, to a sense like where should a good Jewish person be except in shul? But you're not sure about much of anything else about what happens, about prayer, about God, about anything. It, 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 it's, it's all spinning. It's all up for grabs. And you are welcome too in your questioning, in your concern. And I want to let you know that we're using a new prayer book for the first time in a long time. And I really believe that in many ways it reflects a multitude of sensibilities and sensitivities. So for you who are comfortable in the pages of a machzor, I think you will find in this a really beautiful embrace of the tradition. For those of you who are not comfortable, you don't read Hebrew, you don't want to read Hebrew, you're not quite sure about much that goes on here. In the book, there are many different readings and meditations that aren't all about one simple subject, but really do span a multitude of ideas and intentions. So for you who question, I hope this machzor will not serve as an obstacle but in, instead is really a, an entrance, a, a doorway to increase your possibility of using this time for meditation, for recentering. There are those of you here today who are not Jewish, are accompanying uh, Jewish spouses and children, friends, and you, too, are equally welcome on this new year in this sanctuary as you are every day in this temple. Long ago, we understood that the word Jewish community includes so many more people than our grandparents considered. And there might be some controversy about it out there, but in here there is no controversy. In here, it is all about inclusiveness and understanding, in fact, that as we continue to spin into the heart of the 21st century, that it is only with the large, open-hearted sense of community and connectedness that allows us to move forward as a place of spiritual integrity. And so no matter what column or multitude of columns you count yourself, on this first day of the new year, we are all just so honored to share this time with you. Time for prayer and reflection, for hoping, for dreaming, for caring. If you are wearing a talit uh, today, I'd ask you to please rise and join me as we recite the blessing. Rebono Shalom, on this first day of the new year, we ask for your presence in our lives. Give us the courage that we need. Please, God, give us the compassion. Help us to face the world knowing that there truly is a sense of purposefulness for each of us, a place where we might do your will. Baruch Ata Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam asher lehita tef batzitzi. Thank you. <sighs> Oh, oh, oh. 
Precious above all is the soul within me, a spark of childhood innocence, curious, hopeful, loving, and good. Whatever I've done, wherever I've gone wrong, however I've been hurt, I know it still shines. May I return and reconnect with the part of me that belongs to you, my divine core, eternal, incorruptible. Page 141, please rise. Amen. seated. Hello, sun in my face. Hello, you who make the morning and spread it over the fields into the faces of tulips and the nodding morning glories and into the windows of even the miserable and the crotchety best preacher that ever was. Dear star, that just happens to be where you are in the universe, to keep us from ever darkness, to ease
seize us with warm touching, to hold us in the great hands of light. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Watch now how I start the day in happiness, in kindness. Hayom alevavecha, 
Vishinantam libanecha, vidibarta bam, vishivtecha bevetecha, uvlechtecha vaderech, ushochvecha uvkumecha, ukshart hamla oot ayadecha, vihayulatatafot bene necha, uchtavtam, amazuzot betecha uvisharecha. Leman tiskeru vasitem et komitzvotai vitem kedoshim leloechem ani Adonai eloechem asherot seitietchem meretz mitzrayim liot lachem lelohim. Ani Adonai Eloechem. Adonai Eloechem. Emet. So uh, just a couple weeks ago, we opened up our Sunday school season. And uh, it's always very exciting. See families, young and old, coming in, younger, older children. It's just uh, a way of watching the, the year unfold, and it's really quite, it's just great. Anyway, uh, so Mittendrinen, as they say, I'm watching and talking to people, greeting people, and a, a mom uh, walks over to me, and she has on her face a combination of bewilderment and a little embarrassment. And she has with her a little girl I've known all her life. Uh, she went through the preschool, and now she's starting kindergarten. And she's holding her hand, and they're walking towards me. And as they get closer, this wonderful mom takes the child, kind of pushes her daughter in front of her. And she kind of pushes her daughter uh, towards me. And she goes, Rabbi, R Rabbi. I'm like, yeah? She goes, hi, how are you? Great. She says, listen, um, do you have a minute? Uh, my, my, my daughter has a question. I think, okay. And so she walks up to me. You know, we're buds. I've known her a long time. She, walks, she just looks at me. This little girl, these, these big, beautiful brown eyes, you know, and she looks at me and she says, Rabbi, I have a question. If, if God made the world, then who made God? Her mom looked at me apologetically. I didn't know what to say, she said. I, so I told her we'd go talk to the expert. I thought, wow, how nice to be thought of as an expert on God. I mean, that's yichus, you know, that's, that's special. Now, as I'm sure you might imagine, this is not the first time uh, a slightly bewildered mom uh, gently prods her child towards me with one of those big questions. So, of course, the uh, who made God question is a, a popular one. And then, of course, there are the sadder ones where parents just feel so plagued about answering it, which is, where did my papa go when he died? Can I still see my nana somewhere, even though she died? These intensely beautiful and important questions. And then, of course, there's the question, and I'm sure it fits in some sort of Piaget scale of development. Uh, Rabbi, how do you know you're, there's a God if you can't see God? or hear God, or touch God. I mean, how do we figure that out? And then, of course, Rabbi, what does God look like? And then, one of, a couple of my favorites, really. One of them, and it's very touching, because you kind of know where it's coming from. Uh, one of the questions that I've been asked is, Rabbi, does God really live all alone? And then, really, one of the best ever, where a little boy said, Rabbi, does God live with Mother Nature? 
I love that. You know, I just love, I love all of those questions. I love them all. Now, the children who ask these questions are not playing stump the rabbi or stump the parent. They're not being defiant or rude. That comes later. They're doing what comes naturally for young children. In fact, the National Institutes of Health did a study of children and questions. And they came up with this fact. And who had to do this, I don't know. It must not have been easy, but they counted. Between the ages of two and five, the average child will ask 40,000 questions. I know for some of you parents, it feels like that's a weekly allotment of questions. The study from the NIH continues. It reads like this. Children ask information-seeking questions that are related in topic and structure to their cognitive development. Parents give answers to these questions, but when they do not, the children persist in asking for the information, suggesting that the goal of this behavior is not, that the goal is to recruit needed information. The content of these questions shifts within exchanges and over the course of development in ways that reflect concept building. Finally, children generate questions efficiently in order to gather needed information and then are able to use this information productively. They tap into their existing conceptual knowledge in order to do this. Thus, the ability to ask questions is a powerful tool that allows children to gather information they need in order to learn about the world and solve the problems in it. The research here indicates that the very act of asking questions is itself necessary for a child to develop the critical ability to cognitively function. The act of asking the question, in fact, is often more important than the answer. This basic truth about the essential value of asking questions is attested to in a beautiful story that was written in an obit uh, by Arthur Sackler, well-known physician and philanthropist, who uh, 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 someone was here this morning said that he basically uh, uh, founded the medical school in Tel Aviv that bears his name with a program in New York. So he's a remarkable guy in his own right. And so he was asked, Arthur Sackler was, to comment on the death of one of his very close friends, uh, the physics Nobel Prize winner, um, Isidore Rabi. And he just was recalling some anecdotes about these two hugely brained people would sit together and they would schmooze over coffee, over a corned beef sandwich. And so Sackler said, he asked his friend once, why did you become a scientist rather than a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman like all the other immigrant kids in our neighborhood? And Robbie said, you know, my mother made me a scientist, even though I don't think she intended that. I think she would have preferred I become a doctor, frankly, but I went into science. And here's what happened. Every other Jewish mother in Brooklyn would ask her child after school new what did you learn today? But not my mother. My mother would say, Izzy, no, did you ask any good questions? That difference, asking good questions, made me become a scientist. The essential process of kids asking questions is more than just about neurological growth. It's more than shaping neural pathways that are literally being opened as children ask questions and explore and ponder and evaluate reality and how to dream. Constant inquiry helps young kids make sense of and successfully navigate this world around them. Think about how crazy this world is around us, how we as adults are trying to figure out. Imagine if you were a kid. Of course you've got to ask questions. How can they really know who they are without asking over and over again? But the NIH also notes in their research 
that something very sad and troubling happens. By middle school, kids basically stop asking questions. Student motivation and engagement plummets, which raises an interesting question. Do kids stop asking questions because they've lost interest? Or have they lost interest because the rote answer-driven school system doesn't allow them to ask enough questions? There's a fabulous book that came out in 1969, and anyone in my approximate age cohort, if you were in high school or college then, you saw this book. It was called Teaching is a Subversive Activity. And I remember it was a white cover with an apple on the cover, and uh, it was written by Neil Postman and Charles Weingartner. And in that book, Postman writes the following very prescient sentence. He says, children enter school as question marks and leave as periods. So does sculpting a curriculum around the MCAS stifle inquiry and curiosity? Is there anything going on besides teaching to the test, whether the test is the MCAS or the APs or an SAT? It's kind of like that thing that we heard someone tell us, maybe a teacher, maybe a parent, when one day someone looked at us coloring and they said, uh, color in the lines. Like imagine if someone said that to Picasso, stay in the lines. To Jackson Pollock, uh, 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 stay in the borders. This crushing of curiosity, the daring to push outside, seems so often to be compromised. The culture of the American educational system encourages children to withdraw from constant inquiry. There's not enough time for the questions. We've got, some, we've got work to do. We have a syllabus we need to cover. It closes them down, makes them less willing to explore not only the outer reaches of their world, but also, in such, and so much more importantly, their inner world. If one values answers over questions, then it becomes a passive, absorptive process rather than one that challenges the status quo to push, to develop the imagination. But I'm talking about children. But really, in truth, we're the products of a similar education system. How often do we experience a driving sense of curiosity about our own inner or outer world? How good are we, adults, at asking questions? Adults even more so need to make sense of the reality around us to navigate a world that feels increasingly weird and strange with things that are being turned on their head. We feel the oppressive weight of too much to do and not enough time to get it all done. Our default response is to put our head down and charge forward without much pondering the depths of our choices and the ramifications of our decisions. I would say now more than ever, we need to explore where we are, explore what our options are. What is the value of my presence? Now, one reason adults have learned not to ask questions is frankly because if you ask a question, maybe they'll think you're stupid. Now, take the average male aversion to asking directions, which is a stereotype and really pretty true. Now, let's face it, knowledge is power. If I admit there's something I don't know, that gives someone else advantage over me. When I acknowledge there's something I don't know, it makes me vulnerable. So many people would rather get lost in more ways than one than ask questions. A second reason we shy away from questions because we feel awkward about asking deep questions as if such questions are only allowed in foreign films or by philosophers. Because we've allowed our curiosity to atrophy just a little bit, questions of ultimate meaning sound pretentious or, or foolish and just 
out of context with our daily life. This dismissive attitude about asking questions is a true detriment to our spiritual and emotional growth. Sometimes we don't ask questions because we're afraid we won't understand the answers. Rabbi Josh Feigelson calls these hard questions. How will we solve the dilemma in the Middle East? How will the civil war in Syria end? How can we begin to solve the problems of world hunger? What is the solution to the terrible imbalance in this country between the haves and the have-nots? Rabbi Feigelson says a hard question is one that requires special knowledge to answer. So only some people believe they can answer it. If I'm not an expert, I don't want to get involved. I'd rather just hang back. And the truth is about hard questions, the real truth is there are no direct answers to any of them. Gertrude Stein, that wonderful, irreverent woman, once wrote about hard questions, there ain't no answer. There ain't going to be any answer. There never has been an answer. That's the answer. So on this Rosh Hashanah, this first day of the new year, 5777, I challenge all of us of all ages to commit to asking questions. Not the hard ones, the big ones. What is the meaning and worth of my life? How do I want my neighbors to think of me? How do I present myself to the people I work with? What are the things that scare me? What are the things that I yearn to do, but I've been too lazy to pursue? These are the biggest of the big questions. The Maharal of Prague, that great rabbi of the medieval times, who supposedly was the first rabbi, the first person to actually make a golem, he said that people feel satisfied with their view of life and therefore get complacent when it comes to assimilating new ideas. But when a person considers a big question, it opens for us a doorway of perception. It reveals us not as completed beings, but as ever-growing people who can perceive new ideas and achieve new dimensions of consciousness. Asking big questions is a little bit like playing the video game uh, uh, Warcraft, at least the way it looked 20 years ago when it first came out. So you start with a screen, and you're on your screen with just a little lit up area where your little house is. But in order to figure out what's beyond you and what's going on, you have to move your little person into the darkness. If you don't and just sit there, you get attacked and game over. So in order to learn, we must push ourselves out. If we don't ask the questions, we stay sitting in the dark. Asking the big questions helps us to sharpen our sense of what matters to us. It enables us to derive a clearer idea of who we are, what we might become. What matters to you? What would you say are the three principles that you really live by? What would you like to teach from your own life experience to others? Well, lucky for us in Judaism, big questions are not only allowed, they're a very part of the fiber of our lives. How many of you have heard a Jew answers a question with a question? It's a good question. You know, we we have always welcomed questions, and even when we don't welcome them, we can't deny them. We have to ex receive them and ponder the answers. I mean, think about it. Abraham asks God in one of the most chutzpahdik scenes in the entire, not just the Torah, in the entire corpus of Jewish writings. Abraham says to God, who's poised to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham fears that innocent people will be killed. And so he says to God, how can you, the judge of all the earth, do anything but what's right? 
How can you destroy innocent lives? Abraham asking God. And God has to respond. Think about the Passover Seder. The question, not just the four questions, but questions run all the way through, are vital to making a Seder more than just a good meal. What does freedom mean? What might it have been like to be a slave? To be Jewish is to ask questions. To be Jewish is to explore the depths. To be Jewish is to push the envelope. How can we not afford to measure out our curiosity about the soul and the body and God? We must ask big questions now more than ever. So several years ago, uh, Ron Fellman, a member of our congregation, uh, came to me, I think, with a recording device of some sort. And he said, uh, what, right now in this moment, what is the meaning of life? And I was waiting for the punchline. Who asked you that question? But he was serious and asked me the same question a few years later. The point is, this question, this wonderful question, is one that we should take on to ask ourselves and to ask others around us. Asking the question pushes us to measure our souls. So I will be emailing you once a month some big questions. And I hope you'll take the time to ponder them at your dinner table. Or if your kids are older, it's not going to work. So do it in the car while you're carpooling. These big questions that have such meaning, not just for adults, but for, for really for each and every one of us. And I hope that you will send me back your own big questions. And with your permission, I would love to share those with the congregation. In the Torah, after Adam and Eve have done the unthinkable, they've broken the only rule There's only one rule, don't eat from that tree. And guess what they do? They eat from that tree. And of course, once they do, even though it says that Adam and Eve aren't Jewish yet, but they kind of are, I think. So anyway, so uh, Adam and Eve eat the fruit. What's the first thing they do after they eat it? They run and hide because they're feeling guilty, because they're feeling shame. Now, in that moment, as they're hiding behind a tree, God asks them a question. The very first question that God asks of a human being. It's not, and by the way, I I wonder, God looks at Adam and Eve. God just made these two creatures. And now God's looking at them going, what a mess, who, give up. These, these, this creation of mine, one rule, they broke it? What, what did I do wrong? But God doesn't do that. Instead, God asks one question. And the question, in fact, is one word. It's a contraction of one word. God calls out to Adam and Eve, Ayeka! Ayeka! Where are you? God is not saying, what tree are you behind? God is not saying, I can't see you. Raise your hand. Of course, God knows where they are physically. But where were they? What are they thinking? How is it when there's a rule that you should not break that you felt compelled to break it? Ayeka, it's a question, it's an existential question. Where are you? Where's your neshoma? Where is your soul? And so, 
this very same question exists for us. We live in an increasingly, at least it feels to me, an increasingly crazy, concerning world. I feel a gathering darkness. This is no time for hiding. No time for shrugging our shoulders. This is no time to accept the superficial version of our lives. This is the time to go deep. This is the time to be reflective. This is the time to search for some inner clarity. It's time to ponder the big questions. What do you stand for? What are the ways you can promote change? What are your qualities of character that make you proud? Ayeka, where are you? We continue on page 164. We all carry so many big questions about this time, this starting of the new year. And as we get older, we ponder our future. We wonder, how much time do I have? But the truth is, how much time do any of us have? We don't know. And so we try to live our lives as fully, as completely as we can, with as much integrity as we can get the courage to gather. And so we understand when it says in Unatana Tokev coming up, the question, who shall live and who shall die? We understand in our current theology, it's not about God wearing a green banker's lid and dealing out names into a pile of yes, no, and maybe. We understand that. But we do understand that our mortality must make us pause and look, really look, what we choose to do for this coming year. We never know. As we walk each day, like that Warcraft game, you know, it lights up only as we walk. We don't often get too much vision beyond the moment in which we are. But we pray for faith, for strength, for resilience. And we pray that for that, the reward might be simple but profound. For peace, for wholeness, for life. 
please rise from the page 166. Yellow light, light, light. 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 Yellow light, light, light.
Seated on page 179, we continue. On Rosh Hashanah, we plunge like swimmers into a sea of words. On Yom Kippur, the sea rises, then crests, and we emerge, sealed by the wax, warmed by the fire of braided candle. The new year is like a trailhead opening wide before us. The day of fasting, narrow, breathless, so quick to close. We contemplate a new year, and this we know. Some of us will live, some of us will die. Some will die young and some very old. Some by water and some by fire. Some by sword and some by beast. Some by hunger and some by thirst. Some by plague and some by earthquake. Some by stoning and some by strangling. Some of us will feel at ease. Some will be restless. Some will have peace of mind. Some will have strife. Some will be tranquil. Some will be tormented. Some will be raised high. Some will be brought low. Some will have riches. Some will be impoverished. Even so, the way we act, the way we speak, the way we meet God's image in ourselves and in others, these things have great power to make our lives matter. Therefore, let us make whole the broken shards, green and thick the withering grass. Let the wind fill us with urgency for life, let dreams give birth to justice and goodness. God of holiness, God of hope, let us glimpse your truth as we attach our hope to yours. <laughs> through return to the right path, through prayer and righteous giving, 
we can transcend the harshness of the decree. Please rise and turn to page 184. be seated, we continue silently. Sometime there will be a great love, like the love of rain erasing frontiers, growing in all the ears of corn of the Middle East. Sometime, long before the end of days, we shall beat into peace all words of hate and war. <coughs> Shalom is on page 216. Shine. 
Our service continues on page 223. I'd like to invite up as our ARC openers three very caring people, Matthew Miller, Susie Willard Rosenthal, and Bonnie Brodowski. The congregation would please rise.
to invite our Torah carriers for today, Lauren and Eden Sif, Mark and Gabe Rosen to the Bima, please, along with our Torah readers, Sam Abdullah, Jacob Dector, Noah Dector, and Isabel Abdullah. And we continue with our Torah service on page 227. Adonai, Nikema Asecha, Malchut Echa, Malchut, Chol Olamim, Umem Shaltecha, Bechol Dor, Vador. Adonai, Melech, Adonai, Malach, Adonai, Imloch, Adonai, Adonai, God, compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving, and true, showing mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving evil, defiance, and wrongdoing, granting pardon. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Echad Eloheinu Gadol Adonai Kadosh Mekorosh Demo Gadol Adonai Iti
this Torah story, we ask big questions. We wonder, what would I do in Abraham's position? Would I listen to God? What if I were in Isaac's position? Would I let my father tie me to an altar? We ask the questions, if I were Sarah, would I even let my son out of the house? We are really plagued by the questions of Akedat Yitzchak, of this Torah portion on 240, and it just, it throws us for a loop every single time. And I suppose that's what it's meant to do. It is not a text of comfort. It is what one biblical scholar calls a text of terror. And it pushes us to our extreme, to wonder about who we are, to wonder about our sense of who and what God is, to understand how far would we go if our faith demanded it. Now, looking around the room, you might be wondering, what are they doing? doing. So let me uh, explain. Uh, we decided this year we wanted to make the Torah even closer in proximity to you. And so for this Rosh Hashanah, there's one Aliyah, and that uh, goes, that Aliyah, is for the entire congregation. And so first, I would like to ask new members to please stand up. And as I ask you to stand up by your category, would you stand up and whatever Torah you are closest to, please walk over to that Torah. Now, if you don't, if you want to stay seated, you can stay seated. That's how we are. But it would be a, a good thing for the new year to get close to a Torah. So you got the chance you should go for it. So my opinion. So um, if you're new members, would you please rise and make your way to a Torah? If you've been a member over 30 years, would you please rise and now go to your nearest Torah? If you were a preschool student at this temple, if you went to preschool, please stand up and go to a Torah. If you're, the, if you're a parent with a preschooler, or once was a preschooler here, please stand up and go find yourself a Torah. Anyone, one up here, over there, doesn't matter, as long as you find yourself a Torah. If you're a member of the Beth Avodah Board of Directors, please stand up and make your way to a Torah. If it's your first time here visiting, please stand up and make your way to a Torah. If you were living in Israel playing basketball or, or doing anything else, if you'd please rise and go to a Torah. A little shout out over there. And finally, if I didn't call your category, please stand up and go to a Torah. Thanks. 
I appreciate that. <laughs> Come on, get back at daddy. Yeah, yeah. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the Torah blessing in your machzor is on page 230. I invite you to join us since it's all one blessing. We're doing it together. One, two, three. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorach Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim V'na'atan Lanu et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Noten Ato Amen Achar hadevarim ha ele veha elohim nisa et avraham vayomer elav avraham vayomer hineni vayomer kachna et bincha et yachidcha asher ahavta et yitzchak velech lecha el eretz hamoria vehaalehu sham leola al echad heharim asher omar elecha vayashkem avraham vaboker vayachavosh et hamoro Vayikach et shenei ne'arav ito ve'et yitzchak beno. Vayavaka atze ola vayakom vayelech et hamakom asher amar lo ha'elohim. Vayom ha'shelishi vayisa avraham et enav Vayar tamakom merachok. Vayomer avraham el nearav. Shivulachem po imachamor. Vani vehanar. Nelecha ad ko. Venishta chave venashuva alechem. Vayikach avraham et atse haola. Vayashem alitak beno. Vayikach beado. Et ha ish ve et ha machelet, vayal chushenechem yachtav, vayomer yitzak el avraham avi, vayomer avi, vayomer hineni veni, vayomer hine ha ish ve ha itzim, ve ha se leola, vayomer avraham elohim ire lo ha se. Leola Beni, Velchush Nechem Yachtav. Vayavo El Hamakom, Asher Amar Lo HaElohim. Vayiven Sham Avraham Et HaMizbeach, Vayaruch Et HaEitzim, Vayakod Et Yitzchak Beno, Vayasem Oto Al HaMizbeach, Mima laitim. Vaishlach Avraham et Yado, Vaikach et Hamachelet, Lishchot et Beno. Vaikrai lav malach Adonai min Hashamayim, Vayomer Avraham Avraham, Vayomer Hineni. Vayomer al Tishlach Yadecha el Hanar, Vatas lo me Uma, Ki. Ata yadati, ki ere Elohim ata, velo chasachta, et vinchait yechidecha mimeni. Vaisa Avraham et enav, vayar vehine ayil, achar nechaz basevach bekarnav. Vayelech Avraham, vayikach et ayil, vayalehu leola tachapeno. Vayikra Avraham, Shem Hamakom Hahu Adonai Yere, Asher Hamer Hayom Behar Adonai Yere, 
Baikra Malacharanai El Abraham Shenit Min Hashamayim. Asher Asita et Hadavar Haze, Velo Hasakta et Bincha et Yachidecha, Ki Varech Avarechecha, Beharba Arbe et Zaracha, Kehu Hebe Hashamayim, Bechacho Asher Al Sephat Hayam, Bayirash Zaracha et Shar Oyevab. Behit barechu bezaracha, ko ko ye ha aret, ekev, asher shamata bekoli, bayashov avraham el ne arab, bayakumu, bailechu yacheda el beer shaba, bayashev avraham, beer shaba. Folks, blessing after. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam Asher natan lanu Torah demet V'chayei olam nata b'tokhenu Baruch atah Adonai Noten atorah Amen. We continue on page 286. Would you open the doors of the ark? Aleinu l'shabeach l'adon akol L'atet gedula l'yotzer breshit Shelo asanu kegoye aratzot Velo samanu kemishpachot ha'adama Shelo sam chelkenu kahem Vigora lenu kecholamonam Vanachnu korim Umishachavim umodim Lifnei melech Malchei hamlachim Hakadosh baruch 288 Venemar Vehaya Adonai Limelech al kol ha We take this moment to remember those who are not with us, whom death has taken in this season and in years past. We remember loved ones whom we have lost, and we pray that we continue to have the strength, the fortune of memory, that we might hold close those moments that were all about love, that we might hold to examine the times that were not so easy, the times that were frustrating for us and sometimes for them. And in all of that, in the crucible of goodness and the crucible of struggle, we learn more about ourselves to become who we wish to become on the shoulders of those who came before us. Remembering our loved ones and our friends whom we have lost, we turn to page 292. Yitgadal v'yitgadash shemei rabah v'yalma divra chirutei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayichon v'yomeichon v'chayye d'chal beit Yisrael v'agala v'yizman kariv imru amen Yehei shmei rabah mevorach le'olam y'olmei olmaya yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitpa'ar v'yitromam v'yitnasei Vietadar, Vietale, Vietalal, Shemei de Kudsha, Brihu, Laela, Olaela, Mikobir Hata, Vishirata, Tushbehata, Venechemata, Damiran, Bielma, Vimru, Amen, Yehe, Shlama, Rabba, Min Shamaya, the Chaim Alenu, Vielko, Yisrael, Vimru, Amen, O Se, Shalom, Bimromav, 
who ya ase shalom aleinu v'el kol Yisrael v'imru amen. If you'll please be seated. We have uh, just a few important announcements to share with you. And uh, I would like to ask Adam Decker to please come to the Bema. And I would like to say hello to our Rabbi Emeritus, Rabbi Robert Miller, who is with us. Uh, thanks be to God, along with a healthy contingent of family. Welcome. So good to have you here with us sharing in this uh, really beautiful new day and new year. We love how uh, your father's uh, neshoma continues to grow and shine. It really is rather remarkable and uh, a blessing for all of us. So um, welcome to your house. <laughs> You're on. Good afternoon and L'Shana Tova. I am Adam Dechter and I'm here representing the Temple Beth Avoda Institutional Advancement Committee. I am grateful for the committee members and for your time and your commitment to our development efforts. This afternoon I would like to talk with all of you for a few minutes about our annual sustaining campaign. Several years ago our then co-presidents Ron and Debbie Fellman had the brilliant insight to focus on and expand our sustaining membership program. At that time, we were deep in the heart of the Great Recession. As many of our members faced significant employment and financial challenges, requests for dues abatements were swelling. In order to offset a growing budgetary deficit caused by increasing abatements, Ron and Debbie asked for sustaining members to contribute at a higher level beyond their dues alone, to support our temple community's needs. Margie and I believe strongly in supporting our temple and have participated in sustaining membership for several years. In this time, our community has stepped up hugely. Six years ago, we had 18 sustaining members and we raised just under $20,000. This year, I am pleased to report that we have already raised more than $100,000 from 80 families. I am tremendously proud to report that 100% of the 25 member Temple Beth Avoda board is behind the annual sustaining campaign and already has made their own individual contributions. The board's 100% participation rate speaks volumes more broadly to the board's engagement level in sustaining and advancing our temple community. Despite our great progress to date, we have not yet reached our goal for the annual sustaining campaign. Our goal this year is to reach $130,000 through at least 90 gifts. Our goal is based not only on the substantial abatements that continue to be provided to several dozen of our fellow members and their families in need, but like many temples and institutions, our dues alone simply do not cover all of the operating costs that are needed to ensure the continued robust programming that we cherish at our temple. For those who have contributed to our annual sustaining campaign, I cannot thank you enough for your commitment and your generosity. For those who have not yet joined the annual sustaining campaign, I would encourage you to do so. We are so close to meeting our goal and your contributions and generosity will take us across the finish line by Yom Kippur. It is simple to participate. Go to the TBA homepage and locate the support, the, the annual sustaining campaign tab, and select the level of participation that is personally meaningful for you. Alternatively, you can call or stop into the temple office to arrange your gift. Over the coming years, our financial profile and funding sources will continue to evolve. And I have the utmost confidence that this generous community will continue to do what we must to sustain ourselves and each other, and not merely to survive, but to grow and enrich each other's lives and that of the broader community 
and the world around us. That is ultimately what we value collectively and what brings us together in times of reflection, in times of hardship and sadness, and in times of celebration and joy. L'Shana Tova. I made an absolute uh, vow to remind you that as you're leaving today, you get these matching bags, pink and blue, no gender association at all. Uh, you'll notice one of them is for JF and CS, for family table, and the other one is for the Greater Boston Food Bank. We have lists of what they ask us to get from you. I always ask as a favor when you're filling the bag and you go to your pantry, if you will please look at the expiration date before you throw it in. And if you have like, you know, um, pomegranate uh, oil uh, that you bought for recipe four years ago, it's pretty sure that it ain't going to work. So uh, please uh, be judicious in what you put in the bag so that it can be used and it will be healthy and no botulism uh, 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 begins the new year. So there, those are these two bags that we ask you to fill. And uh, you will get them, bring them back on Yom Kippur, if not before. And uh, we will uh, be sure to take them. Uh, finally, uh, I want to say uh, that tomorrow morning, oh, and t later today at 4 PM, we will be uh, joining those of you who are interested in joining us uh, for Tashlich, the traditional ceremony of casting one's crumbs on the water as a way of symbolically shedding our sins for a new year, a cleansed slate. Now, uh, having said that, I've only learned recently that uh, apparently feeding uh, wildlife excessive breadcrumbs is not good for them. Uh, and so, um, but if you're a traditionalist and you got some crumbs waiting at home, please bring them. However, we have a new uh, tradition to uh, inaugurate. And uh, it's going to be very cool, but I can't tell you what we're going to do. you got to show up. But it'll be worth it. Uh, so after our service, you can go home, change, come back in, in, in comfortable clothing, in jeans, whatever. Uh, but join us. It's a, a brief service, but we're outside. And it just feels like a wonderful way to officially begin this period uh, by saying the slate can be cleaned and we can start again. That's really one of the whole points. And with that, oh, and tomorrow morning service uh, begins at 10 AM. And we are very, very lucky that our speakers tomorrow are Dr. Gary Gottlieb and Dr. Derry Stasel, who will be talking about their extraordinary work in helping people who most desperately in need, both here in our city as well as uh, in other places of the world. And I am very eager to hear more about the work. And one of the big questions that I want to ask that will, God willing, uh, be pondered is with so many opportunities to do so much and to have chosen the work you do, which is not the easiest path, why and how and like that. So we're thrilled about your joining us tomorrow. Look forward to hearing more about your work and about its connections to doing our best to live a righteous life. And I think, I think we're good. All right. Ya amdu hagbogalila. The honor of lifting and dressing the Torah goes to Stacy Schwartz. Emma Schwartz and Bonnie Millender, and also to uh, Steve Ayer, to Josh Amagdi, you're up, Adam and Margie Dector, Larry, Joan, and Emily Siff. Those are our Torah lifters. So if the Torah lifters and dresses, please go to your locations. Okay. So the Deutsches are in position. Okay, I think we're good. But everyone, please rise. Torah's up. Vezot Torah, Asher Samoshe, Lifnei
Bnei Yisrael, help me Adonai, the Admoshe. It's the season of our lives. It's the time, a time to be grateful. Open your heart, open your eyes, reach out loud. A time to be grateful.
Thank you. 